graduation, he served as an instructor in physics at Harvard University for two years before joining the staff of the Bell Telephone Laboratory. The research in which Dr. Garrett has been involved includes low-temperature physics, semiconductor surface properties, and luminescence of solids. Since 1960, he has been in charge of a group primarily concerned with research on optical measures. Dr. Garrett is a fellow in the American Physical Society and the author of a book entitled Magnetic Cooling. And his latest book, Gas Lasers, will be available from McGraw Hill in the near future. In addition, he has written over 40 technical articles in various fields of solid state physics, which have been published in British, French, Netherlands, and the American journals. The title of Dr. Garrett's lecture this afternoon is Lasers, Light Amplification by Simulated Emission of Radiation. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Garrett. I would like to add my thanks to those of my pre predecessors in this series for the kind invitation to talk here on the campus of Ball State University. It is um, a pleasure and privilege to be here for a couple of days and see the sort of thing that you are doing and the great university that you are building here. I wanted to talk this afternoon about lasers and my talk is going to have three sections, very roughly. In the first section, I would like to tell you about what a laser is and give you some rough idea of how it works. Then in the second section, I would like to tell you what lasers are good for in the area of physics research. I'm a physicist myself, and I suppose I am more qualified to talk upon the scientific aspects of lasers than their engineering aspects. Then, in the third and last part of my talk, I want to give you some idea as to the areas of usefulness in technology of one sort and another. I won't have very much to say about um, James Bond. Those of you who saw Goldfinger may perhaps remember the attempt to bisect get James Bond with a laser, which, if I remember, was uh, frustrated in the nick of time. Uh, at the time that film was made, such a thing was barely possible. In fact, it wasn't possible at all. There are nowadays lasers that could do you a fair amount of damage if you happen to get in the road of the beam. Whether you could be bisected as neatly as the film indicated, I doubt. So, let me start off by saying what a laser is. A laser is a device that produces what physicists call a beam of coherent light. And the word coherent is the source of a great deal of uh, confusion and muddled thinking. And in fact, it's a word that I will not attempt to define very precisely uh, today. What in fact one means qualitatively is this. You have a source of light waves which resembles a, an oscillator, a generator of low-frequency electrical signals in every particular except that the frequency is very much higher. The frequency, of course, is what distinguishes light from radio waves or microwaves, but the sources of light that we have in this room up here don't behave in the same manner as a radio frequency or microwave oscillator in that instead of giving out a nice clean signal which is uh, in a well-defined uh, spatial arrangement, what comes out of the lights above us is a jumble of all frequencies, uh, from the red to the blue, and some beyond blue and beyond the red, and is not well organized in direction either. So it is, as physicists would say, very incoherent, or not at all coherent. Now, a laser is a device that will produce a coherent beam of light, meaning by that that you can dictate its spatial disposition very precisely 
and furthermore, the signal that comes out is a very precisely one color or wavelength. I haven't got one here. Uh, lasers are fairly old hat at the present time, so far as these uh, demonstrations are concerned, and those of you who are, are in the physics department will probably have seen the uh, gas laser which uh, they have there, and uh, which uh, is perhaps rather typical of the, uh, of the kind of laser that uh, can be uh, fairly easily constructed and used for some uh, scientific experiments. However, I have a flashlight here, and to take some of the magic out of the word laser, which I think is one of my jobs today, let me just say that if I had in my hands a laser, it would behave very much like this flashlight. With this flashlight, I can, as you can see, illuminate the wall over there with a patch of light, and it's a patch of rather yellowish-white light. If I looked at that light with a prism or with some kind of interferometer, I would find that, in fact, there was a confused jumble of all frequencies from the red to the blue and uh, off to both ends. Uh, whereas if what I was holding in my hand was a laser, the light would be seen to be of just one color. It might be green, it might be blue, it might be red, it might be invisible, depending on the precise laser which I was holding. So that would be one distinction. Uh, the other distinction is this. The beam which comes out of this flashlight is obviously quite reasonably parallel. Now, it is reasonably parallel because there is a tiny hot filament inside this flashlight behind which there is a par paraboloidal mirror which takes the light coming from this tiny hot filament and projects it all in one direction, the same way a searchlight works. Now, the beam that comes from a laser is like that except that it's much more parallel. And in fact, so parallel that I could, if I focused it down on the far side of the room there, get the light to an area comparable in size to a wavelength of light, which is about one ten thousandth of a centimeter. So, a laser is like this, except one, that the signal which comes out uh, is monochromatic, of just one color or wavelength, and two, that this signal comes out in a beam which is much more nearly parallel than the beam which comes from this flashlight. Now, uh, let me give you some idea of how a laser works. At this point, I would ask if the gain on the microphone system could be turned up. That is, in many ways, an acoustic analog of a laser. To explain this, I'd better wander over here. What is happening is that there is a loop, some portions of which are electrical and some portions of which are acoustic, such that if a little signal gets started around that loop, it will grow. Specifically, if there is a little rustle or disturbance in the room, it can be picked up by the microphone. It will then be amplified through the electronic system and broadcast through the speakers, and some of it will get back to the starting point. Now, the point is that if the round-trip gain, that is to say, the... Uh, ratio of the output signal to the input signal gets greater than unity, the whole thing can break into oscillations, meaning by that that if there is a small disturbance, it will be a little bit bigger the first time round, a little bit bigger the second, until eventually what started off as a small rustle or disturbance that you could hardly hear becomes amplified until it is a very painful sound. Now, a laser does the same thing. It does, however, involve electrical, electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic interactions rather than acoustic ones. However, before we leave this uh, singing of the public address system, uh, let me ask you to notice one other thing about it. And that is that uh, the sound that eventually comes round to you is not just a what uh, 
electrical engineers or acousticians might call white noise, it is in fact very clearly a definite musical note. Will we have that again, please? Thank you. It's a definite musical note. And by and large, you get the same musical note each time you turn the gain up. As a matter of fact, there are tricks you can play in the sense that um, uh, it is possible if you walk around and turn the gain up in a new place to get a slightly different musical note. But so long as you keep the microphone in the same place and the speakers in the same place, uh, the system will find a note that it likes to, to oscillate at. Now, why is this? What we've got to do is to plot. I promise I won't use this board very much. I'm only going to use it for two pictures. I hope that at the back you'll be able to see this. I'm going to make a plot here as a function of frequency of the gain and the loss. What do I mean by gain? I mean basically the gain in the boxes behind the curtain there. By loss, I mean what fraction of the original acoustic signal uh, gets back to the starting point. Now, the gain depends upon the particular kind of amplifiers that he has there, and by and large, this will be something that has a certain band where it's reasonably good and falls off at the top and at the bottom. So let me call this thing G for gain. Now, the loss is a much more complicated curve and is going to depend upon the precise shape of the auditorium. And in fact, if you have one point, uh, if you are asking what is the transfer impedance, in effect, between this point and that point, you've got to think about all the possible echoes and all the possible ways in which sound can bounce about in this auditorium. And it will turn out that at some frequencies, there is a good uh, in trans impedance from point A to point B, and at other frequencies, there is very poor. So I've got to draw here some jagged curve, like so. And I label this thing L, which means loss. Now, in order for the system to start singing for you, you must arrange that the loop gain, which will be the product of G and L, is just unity. If it's a little bit more than unity, then the thing will grow uh, until you start burning out batteries or running into saturation on the tubes and the amplifier or something like that. If it's a little bit less than unity, it will die away, and so in fact will never get started. So somewhere up here, there is a line which I will call unity, what you've got to do mentally is to multiply that curve labeled G by the curve labeled L and uh, see what happens. Well, clearly here is a point at which the loss uh, is, I guess what I should be plotting here is one over loss, where the loss is small and the gain is reasonably high. So that as I gradually increase the scale of this by turning up the volume, which in effect means that I shift up the curve labeled G there, this is probably the point at which the product will first hit that dotted line. And that means that that is the frequency at which the auditorium will sing. Now, the laser is a system just like this, except, as I said, that you are dealing not with sound waves but with light waves, uh, and you are dealing not with an electronic amplifier connected on the one side to a microphone for input and on the other side to a speaker for output, but you are dealing with a collection of atoms which are excited in some way and which are capable of providing optical gain within some bandwidth. Now, just as in this case, there was a limited range of frequencies, perhaps it's 20 kilocycles, I don't know what it is for this particular system, within which acoustic waves are well amplified. So in the case of the electromagnetic system, there is a limited range of frequencies, uh, perhaps it's 1,000 megacycles broad, perhaps it's more than that, within which there is some appreciable amplification. However, just as in this case, we had a jagged line representing, if you wish, the response of the auditorium. So, in the case of a laser, we have some similar curve 
which represents the response of the box in which we put these excited atoms, or in the jargon of the subject, the laser cavity. And we've got to do the same thing. We have got to arrange that the round trip gain, the loop gain, is just unity at some uh, frequency. So as we start increasing the excitation of the atoms, to begin with, nothing happens because at all frequencies, the loop gain is less than unity, and so any little disturbance has no chance to build up into a large singing effect. As we, however, excite the atoms increasingly, there comes a point at which the product of, of the gain times the reciprocal loss just gets up to unity for some particular frequency within that band of frequencies which the atomic system can amplify. And when that happens, oscillation occurs. And the reason that I ask you to listen carefully and notice that the sound that you heard was a single musical note is that exactly the same phenomenon occurs in the optical case. That is to say, when threshold is reached, the signal which comes out of the box is uh, the electrical analog of a pure musical note. It is very monochromatic much more so than that range of frequencies which the atomic system originally was capable of amplifying. I could even push the analogy a little bit further if I cared. Uh, those of you who know about uh, the nature of a musical tone know that, in fact, a single frequency, that is to say, something which in time has a pressure varying simply as cos omega t, is a very dull and uninteresting note and would be rejected by most composers as a vehicle for composition. And in fact, the sound which is produced when you strike the key of a piano or bow the string of a violin is not just one single frequency, but a single frequency plus a collection of harmonics, the second harmonic being the octave above, the third harmonic being an octave and a fifth above, and so on. As a matter of fact, if you had taken this sound which we he all heard just now and looked at it with a frequency analyzer, you would probably have found that there were, uh, in addition to the fundamental uh, higher harmonics associated with the uh, imperfections of the amplification system. Now, that sort of thing can happen also with a laser. If you let the electromagnetic singing, if you wish, grow beyond a certain point, then you can see in the output from this laser not just a single frequency corresponding to that at which oscillation is supposed to set in, but also, if circumstances are with you, the second harmonic of this, which will be a frequency twice as high, possibly the third harmonic which is a frequency three times higher than the original. Now, let me at this stage draw very schematically what any laser looks like, and I think to do this all I need to do is to turn this blackboard upside down. You may perhaps, some of you know, that uh, there are gas lasers and there are solid state lasers and that there are injection lasers. The newspapers sometimes would even have you believe there are liquid lasers. And I don't want to get into all of that. What I would like to do is to show a general picture which would hold for any one of these and has all of the essential parts to it. To do this, let me draw a box here and label it medium. And let me draw another box underneath, connected to the first by an arrow, and let me label that pump. And let me put this medium what is meant to be the optical analog of this auditorium, that is to say a cavity, something that will allow light 
to bounce back and forth, giving light echoes, if you wish, just as sound can bounce back and forth in this room and give sound echoes. And I will indicate this very schematically by showing here a couple of objects which are meant to be mirrors. I've shown them curved. They could be flat. They could, in principle, be any shape. They're usually curved in practice, so let's have them curved. Now, the pump is the source of the energy which will drive the system. Obviously, we're not going to get anything out unless we put something in. And the pump is the object which gets the medium here into a state in which it is capable of amplifying a light wave. Then, a light wave can bounce back and forth between these two mirrors, and if the round trip gain from some point here, round and back to the beginning again, gets up to unity, the thing can spring into oscillation, and when it does, there will be a strong light wave bouncing back and forth between these mirrors. Now, if we arrange that one of these mirrors, while reasonably well reflecting, still transmits some fraction of the light falling upon it, what ensues is the appearance of a beam of light which comes out through that mirror. And that's what a laser is. Now, I don't want to go into very great detail as to what happens in that box labeled medium. In fact, the name laser comes, uh, includes within it the uh, two words simulated emission, that's the S and the E. And simulated emission is a process which one generally meets for the first time in studying the quantum theory of radiation and has to do with the fact that if you excite uh, atoms in a, a particular way uh, such that they are in a state in which they can emit light, then the presence of uh, some light already in the system at the starting time will make the system emit faster than it would in the absence of that light. If that sounds complicated, in fact it ought not to be, because simulated emission is not really a quantum process at all. It's a plain old-fashioned process which you can understand uh, in terms of acoustic analogies and which would therefore have been quite familiar to such great 19th century classical physicists as Lord Rayleigh. Now, as I indicated just now, there are various kinds of laser, and in some of these, the medium is a gas, like the gas that you have in a Geissler tube or neon sign. In some of them, it is a synthetic uh, a crystal of some sort, such as a synthetic ruby. In some of them, it can be even a piece of semiconductor, similar to the kind of semiconductor which is used to make a transistor or diode. Now, some of these media are pumped electrically. In the case of the neon sign, for example, you get the thing going by having a couple of electrodes and connecting them to a power supply, just as you would if you were uh, trying to uh, illuminate a sign for advertising purposes. The other, uh, in, in some of the other uh, lasers, as for example with those that make use of a synthetic ruby crystal for the medium, one excites by uh, exposing the crystal to an intense flash of light. Typically this is done not continuously, but in a single flash, and the pump then typically consists of the kind of flash lamp which uh, you may yourselves have used for flash photography. Uh, typically these are rather larger than those that are used for, for uh, home photography, but the principle is the same. So, I hope I've given you some idea of what a laser is and how a laser works. Let me now spend the rest of my time telling you what lasers are good for. Now, in terms of physics, I have to distinguish two classes of experiment, one of which generally makes use of the very high power which can be obtained from a laser, and the other generally makes use of the very high purity of the frequency. 
which uh, is therefrom derived. Now, in terms of high power, and this perhaps is the area where most of the interesting physics has been done so far, uh, one uh, can uh, use a laser to study the non-linear optical properties of crystals. Now, when I was trying to explain just now uh, how, when you turn up the gain on the amplifier system, you may get, get not a pure note, but a note which has in it also the octave and the octave and the fifth and other frequencies, I indicated that uh, the same thing will happen or can happen in the case of an optical oscillator in that additional frequencies uh, other than the fundamental uh, can be produced. Now generally one doesn't look for such frequencies in the output of the laser itself but one can do other experiments in which for example one takes the output of the laser and uses it to illuminate some crystal, some lump of material and then sees whether in the light which, come, which gets through that crystal or is reflected from it, there is generated some light of uh, twice or three times the frequency. And this is the subject which is called nonlinear optics. It is, if you wish, a rather natural extension of experiments that can be done at lower frequencies and have been done for a number of years. For example, if you take a uh, an insulating crystal of some sort, let's say rock salt, something like that, and place it between a couple of metal plates, thereby making a condenser, you can measure the capacity of that condenser and in that way determine the dielectric constant of rock salt. And you will get the same answer, in general, if you measure the capacity with one volt across the plates of the condenser or with a thousand volts. That means that the dielectric is behaving linearly in that the polarization is always proportional to the applied voltage. Now, if you go to a sufficiently high voltage with such a condenser, other things will happen. Ultimately, of course, there is a spark which may break the crystal, and that is highly nonlinear optics. However, before you get quite to that point, you will notice some incipient uh, difficulty in that the polarization will cease to be quite exactly linear in the applied field and uh, if you make measurements precisely in the region just before the spark actually occurs uh, you will be able to learn what are the departures from linearity in the low frequency properties of rock salt. Now we have not been able to do such experiments in the visible range of frequencies up till now because no source of light that we have had up till now has been anything like strong enough to get one into the range where such things happen. With lasers, we now can do this, and a whole science has grown up studying the, uh, what happens to material objects, to crystals, liquids, and what have you, uh, when they are exposed to fields at a frequency so high that uh, one can no longer say that the polarization is just proportional to the electric field. I don't want to uh, pursue this point uh, in detail this afternoon, but for example, you can do fascinating experiments, and we recently have done such, uh, in which one takes a crystal and exposes it to light from a laser emitting uh, in the far infrared at a frequency uh, close to one of the natural crystal vibration frequencies of some particular crystal. When you do this, you find that you modify the properties of that crystal at higher optical frequencies. And uh, this can be used to uh, understand the uh, nature of the departures from linearity in such a system, and in this way, for example, to bring together uh, a number of different physical effects measured at much higher and much lower frequencies. Now, when I was telling you about what would happen if you made a condenser out of rock salt, 
and pointed out that you can, by increasing the voltage far enough, not just measure uh, some nonlinearity, but actually produce something much more catastrophic to wit allow, cause a spark to pass. Uh, I can now say that the same things, the same is true for a system exposed to the very high electric field from a laser. And it is the case that if you take some of the existing very high power lasers, which typically operate only for a very short time, and focus the beam down as tight as you can get it, you will find that there is an actual spark in the air near to the focus of the beam. Now that spark is quite fascinating for a variety of reasons and is under study at the present time. This, for example, the temperature uh, ceases to be something that you can define very precisely, but you can define separate electronic and ionic temperatures. And when you attempt to measure these quantities, you typically get temperatures of the order of a million degrees. Well, that's quite hot, and it's interestingly hot from some points of view, but we would like it perhaps to be 10,000 times hotter still. If one could get the temperature of the gas in that focal region up to 10 to the 10 degrees, that's 10 billion rather than a million, uh, that is a temperature hot enough for certain fusion, nuclear fusion reactions to go, and one might perhaps hope that uh, this, one might start looking for some neutrons, let's say, might perhaps hope that this was a way of uh, getting at, uh, at any rate, uh, a possible trigger for a useful thermonuclear reaction. And in fact, if you sit down and do a little sum and ask yourself, how hot should such a system get if all of the available energy could be used to heat up a volume of air, let's say, at normal temperature and pressure, one cubic wavelength in size, you can convince yourself that such temperatures ought in principle to be attainable. Well, why aren't they? Well, of course, uh, as soon as you begin to heat a little volume of gas like this, it will start to expand. It will expand very fast. There will, in fact, be a shock wave, which is supersonic, and as it expands, it cools. And at the present time, I'm not telling you that one has any realistic hope of reaching temperatures of the order of 10 to the 10 degrees. I'm only saying this is an interesting way of getting a small volume of gas very hot. We should be studying its properties, and maybe eventually, when lasers develop a little bit further, uh, we might, just for the hell of it, see how much hotter still one can get that region. Now, uh, I said there were two classes of physical experiment. The second is one that makes use of high resolution. This is a rather technical area, terribly important for the physicist, but one that is rather difficult to explain in more popular terms. I simply mean to say that the uh, an object which gives out a very clean frequency, very well defined as a laser does, is something that you can typically use to investigate very sharp and very weak spectral lines and some experiments have been done using lasers along these lines. The real interest, this is my personal prejudice, uh, the real interest in that area is probably in the infrared, where high resolution, high sensitivity spectroscopy has been terribly difficult up until now because the only sources that we have had before the advent of the laser were hot bodies. And a hot body doesn't really give you very much power in that frequency range. Now that we have lasers, we are starting on the path of using these as spectral sources in much the same sense as a klystron is used <coughs> as a spectral source in, for example, electron spin resonance. And we hope in this way to be able to look at weak and narrow spectral lines in the infrared, which have been uh, inaccessible before. Let me now turn to my third and last topic, which is techno the technology. And I wish again to emphasize that uh, 
I am not myself primarily competent in these applications areas, but I think I can make statements here which are likely to be reasonably correct, and uh, therefore, since I'm sure many of you are interested, let me try to do so. In technology, uh, we at uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories naturally think first in terms of communications, and a substantial effort uh, is being made to see what can be the usefulness of lasers and systems based on lasers for getting information from one point to another. Now the point which I'm sure all of you know and which everyone makes and all of the advertising from communications companies makes is the fabulous bandwidth of a laser. And really what's meant by that is the following, that since the frequency of a laser oscillating in the visible is very high, uh, to wit, of the order of, let's say, 300 trillion uh, cycles per second or more, uh, it should be possible, in principle, to modulate the such beam and thereby to impress on it information with no limitations as to the bandwidth set by the frequency of the light itself. See what I'm saying? You could take 60 cycles from the wall and use that as a carrier of information and modulate it. But you're pretty much strapped to a bandwidth of the order of 60 cycles, or else if you attempted to modulate such a signal at a much higher frequency, then you might just as well be modulating DC. Now, uh, typically we have carrier systems at the moment that are based on um, uh, frequencies of the order of 10 kilomegacycles, and uh, one doesn't find it convenient to use the whole band of 10 kilomegacycles from naught up to the carrier frequency, but one can use some substantial fraction, perhaps 5 or 10 percent of the carrier frequency, and in that way transmit a fair amount of information. Now, with light, the carrier frequency is 10,000 times higher still. And therefore, if one can develop the components, modulators, detectors, and what have you, which are capable of using the bandwidth, which is there waiting for use, one has a simply fabulous uh, capacity for communicating information from one point to another. And one talks here not just about the transmission of uh, 100 million television channels, which I think was much used in the early days of the laser as an illustration of how much and how frightful might be its consequences. But also, uh, one wants to think in terms simply of the transmission of data, which, as the years go by, is clearly exploding at an even faster rate than is the need for communication between human beings. In other words, uh, suppose that you have uh, large computer centers with customers some distance away, and their need is to have access to the large computer on a time-sharing basis. As the closer you get in to the central computer, the larger the bandwidth which you will need until it is possible to envisage, maybe by the year 2000, a uh, need for bandwidth which so far exceeds anything that can be done with radio frequency or microwave links as to make existing systems uh, simply infeasible. Now, uh, the, the usefulness then of a laser communication system uh, centers on the bandwidth. And that bandwidth, the system itself, uh, can only compete with existing systems if uh, the economic says so. Uh, we need, in order to make such systems, to have components that will do the various jobs, modulation, detection, and so on. And by and large, we have such components. There are now good modulators and good detectors with uh, bandwidths of the order at any rate of 10 kilomegacycles, and that looks as though it's interesting enough to start with. In fact, the real difficulty at the moment in designing a laser communication system is a very trivial one, which is, how do you get the light from point A to point B? You can go 
across the ground through the open air, provided it's a fine day, but then it is occasionally foggy and it's occasion it occasionally rains. And uh, what can you do when your system is exposed to such interference? And the answer certainly seems to be not very much. When it rains, worse still when it snows, the amount of information that you can get through, the amount of light you can get through, is so small as to make any such system virtually useless. Therefore, much effort has been uh, spent in the direction of trying to see how to guide a sophisticated light beam, by which I mean a light beam originating in a laser and then having had impressed on it a large bandwidth of information of some sort through a pipe. And this, in principle, can be done. You can have a narrow light beam which sets off down the axis of a pipe, and it will go some distance, and then, of course, the beam will gradually spread, even if it was parallel to begin with, and when it spreads to a diameter of the order of the diameter of the pipe, it will get lost. So you don't allow that. You put a lens in, a very weak lens, which focuses the beam gently back down again until it's parallel, and then a short while afterwards, the light beam again spreads and you put another lens. And that can be done. You can even, in fact, get rid of lenses and simply have a system whereby, uh, let us say, there is gas in the tube and either a temperature gradient along the radius or possibly a composition gradient. Imagine, for example, having two gases such that the concentration of one is great on the axis and the concentration of the other is great near the outside. And such a so-called gas lens will do the focusing for you. And in fact, you can easily design on paper such a system uh, to uh, keep the light beam more or less parallel in competition with the tendency of diffraction to take the light beam and spread it out and lose it in the walls. Well, uh, that's very fine. Uh, the difficulty at the present time is that you have to make such a thing very precisely because if you don't, if there are random errors, if there are kinks in the pipe, or in the case of lenses, if one lens gets a little bit out of position, the system is not a self-correcting one. By that I mean that the errors increase with time as the square root of a number of lenses, as in the famous problem of the drunkard's walk, and uh, the system is not strong focusing as certain nuclear machines are. And the only way that has been found around that is to say, well, let us take those lenses and sense occasionally and see whether the light beam is wandering off a bit to one side or to the other, and if it is, we will give a correction signal to the lens and move it back. And that begins to sound fairly expensive. So that's what I have to say about communications. There have been applications, for example, in the uh, radar or radar-like area. Uh, some time ago, a Hughes Aircraft Company was offering for sale a uh, rangefinder for use uh, for ranging a tank, let's say, on a battlefield, with uh, a distance of the order of two or three miles in mind. And this was rather um, uh, was a fabulous engineering job because they had designed a laser and its power supply and the optics to get the right kind of beam to come out and the detector and some electronics for measuring the round uh, trip delay and batteries for powering the whole thing and had managed to get this into a package which was uh, portable, at least portable in the sense that an infantryman was supposed to be able to carry it. I think it weighed 44 pounds. Now, this device would measure for you the distance of a tank on a battlefield and would give you the answer to four significant figures. I'm not sure, in fact, I'm not an expert in these matters, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, such accuracy is really usable because typically the problem on the battlefield is that there is wind and things like that which will tend to disturb the course of a shell. So, as I understand the battlefield problem, one more usually wants to get a measurement to 5% or something pretty crude, 
and you then set the range on your guns and lob the thing over, and if it overshoots, you pull the range down by 5%. If it then undershoots, you can gradually zero in. In other words, I'm not sure that the uh, ability to measure uh, distances that precisely is, in fact, all that useful, but you can see uh, that, obviously, there are uses in the general area of surveying which, uh, for which a laser has a poss possible future. Now, uh, excuse me. Uh, well, there is an area in technology where lasers have already turned out to be exceedingly useful, and that is in what may strike you as the rather trivial one of drilling holes. There is a classic problem of making holes in diamonds in order to use them for drawing wire. Uh, and in companies like Western Electric, which manufacture large quantities of wire, uh, they have had to spend fair amounts of money making a whole set of diamond dies of steadily uh, decreasing size, such that you start with the wire and pull it through the biggest, and then pull it through the second biggest, and the third biggest, and so on, until eventually it's down to the size that you want. And these diamonds wear in time, as you might expect, and when the little one wears a bit, you move it one step to the right, and so on. Now, the process of making the original die has turned out to be quite an expensive one. Diamond, as you know, is very hard, and the hole has to be a rather precise shape, and this has been a time-consuming and costly operation. It has, however, been found that uh, a pulsed ruby laser will drill rather nice holes in diamond, and this is an application which is already on the production line. Some ambitious people would also like to drill holes in missiles. Uh, this has uh, been the subject of a lot of gossip, some of it classified, over the past um, half dozen years, and I don't really know where the pundits stand at the moment. Uh, when it was first discussed, uh, anyone who knew about lasers could go to a blackboard and go through the orders of magnitude and convince himself that the thing failed by a factor of about a billion to be of any use for a variety of reasons, one of which is the simple one that you don't get more energy out of a laser than you put into it. You get less, and usually you get a good deal less. Uh, a second is that at a useful range of, let's say, a thousand miles, uh, the, the beam is likely to spread a good deal unless you use a mirror of rather fabulous size, and you won't find yourself drilling a hole in the missile, you'll find yourself gently warming it up through half a degree or so in an area that's perhaps a square yard or so in size. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, more recently, there have been some rather dramatically high-power lasers developed. Uh, there is a laser which oscillates in the infrared uh, at a frequency about to 15 times lower than the eye can see, frequency of uh, wavelength of about 10 microns. Uh, and this can oscillate continuously with a power output of the order of a kilowatt and with efficiencies of the order of um, 10 or 15 percent. I think that um, that probably br brings the unfavorable factor down from a billion to maybe only 100,000 or so, and that's five years' progress, and maybe in time we will have some means of drilling holes in missiles. Uh, one area which has received a lot of publicity is the medical one. Uh, you, many of you, will know of the use of lasers in eye surgery for the operation of reattaching a detached retina. Now, uh, I don't know. You get different stories from different medicos on this. Uh, the old way of welding a retina back in place was to use a xenon arc lamp and a lens. And this, although it took longer, and as I understand it, involved a certain amount of pain, was a process which you can follow as you're doing it. And if, you're not, if you didn't do a bit right, you can go back and try again. With a laser, it's ping and you've had it, and you don't quite know what it's going to turn out like, and if you've made a mistake, there's not much that can be done. So, in any case, I understand that cryosurgery is coming in as a means for coping with such conditions. There was um, a news item a couple of years ago 
on the use of lasers uh, in the treatment of cancer, which caused a great flurry. And I don't know where that stands, except that shortly after this news item, I heard um, a description, I heard some comments on this from a cancer expert who was not um, involved in this particular experiment. And his position was this, that the particular malignancy which was made to uh, disappear as a result of illuminating a small part of it with a flash from a ruby laser is well known to be a peculiar and sensitive malignancy which will usually retreat even if you just scratch it with a scalpel or hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and that uh, he wasn't convinced that lasers were much used for the cure of cancer and wouldn't be until they tried some uh, different kind of carcinoma. Now, uh, there is, of course, a whole area of interest in optics. Uh, la lasers are terribly useful for teaching elementary physical optics. Uh, Young's two-slit interference, all of the experiments that you learn about and that are rather tiresome to do with a sodium lamp can be done very nicely with lasers and I'm sure that this will represent a substantial use simply for teaching physical optics. Uh, also, of course, uh, lasers are very good for optical testing as, for example, when you want to use interference fringes to determine whether some object is flat or precisely spherical or something like that. Well, I think I'd better close at this stage since it's now four o'clock. I haven't talked at all about holograms. That really is a separate topic in itself, which is something that can be realized imperfectly with ordinary light sources, but which has really blossomed since the advent of the laser. Uh, there are perhaps things that can be said about that, but perhaps I should postpone that uh, to uh, any discussion period which now ensues. Thank you.